Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel for part three of our FlightSim.com Force Feedback Yoke Review. Coming up on today's episode of 2020 Flight Simmers. Welcome back. In today's video, I will demonstrate the FlightSim.com force feedback yoke. We will be testing things like max pitch force, as well as some of the effects that are in the force feedback software. We will also go over some corrections that I need to make from part two when I went over all the features in the force feedback software. I will then go over my SPAD configuration for the force feedback yoke if you're someone who is not going to be using the default Microsoft Flight Sim keybinds. I also put up a question on the Discord before making this video, and that was, what is something that everyone would like to see about the yoke? And overwhelmingly, everyone wanted to know how to make profiles. So, I'll go over my process for creating various profiles for different aircraft. Once we're through with that, I'll wrap everything up with my final conclusion about the product, and we will weigh out the price versus the hardware and the product itself, and whether this is something you may want to add to your home cockpit. Now, before we get rolling, I've got two disclaimers. FlightSim.com did send me the product for review. However, I am not being paid for my reviews, and all the opinions about the product are mine and mine alone. FlightSim.com is also not privy to any of my videos beforehand and are seeing this just as you are. Second, I am not a pilot, so I will not be able to compare the actual forces in an aircraft to the force feedback yoke itself. If you would like input from a real-world pilot, Russ Barlow did a fantastic review. I will also post his link down below in the description. And lastly, I want to thank FlightSim.com and Fabian for sending me out the product for review. I also want to shed some light on Fabian and the team over there at FlightSim.com on the fantastic work they have been progressing on with the force feedback software as well as the firmware for the unit. Fabian and his team have been actively working to fix any issues or concerns from hardware to software from the Discord community. If you're not part of that community, I would highly recommend to check that out. I will have a link down below in the description. Another thing that I would like to bring to light that Fabian is working on is for the A2A Comanche. Now, as a lot of people may or may not know, the A2A Comanche uses their own software as far as how they transmit and receive information. However, for all of the A2A fans out there, rest assured that Fabian is already in contact with A2A to get these issues resolved to make your experience that much better inside of the Comanche. Now, with all of that out of the way, if you have any comments or questions, post them down below in the comments section, and I'll get right back with you. If you enjoyed today's content and find it useful, make sure to hit that subscribe, tick on that little bell, and smash that thumbs up button. It is greatly appreciated. If you missed part one and two of the series, I will post links down below in the description. Check those out. In part one, we did a teardown of the product so you could see firsthand all the components that go into making the force feedback yoke possible. Okay, we're back in the A2A Comanche. I thought this would be a great aircraft to test. Now, remember, I did say at the beginning that we are having some trim issues. So what my plans are is to show you some of the effects in the Comanche, and then we'll switch over to the Duke, and we'll go over some more of the effects in there. Before we get started, the first thing I want to do is show you the force feedback software, and I want to bring everybody's attention to the graph section on the first page in the general tab. The graph page is going to have a couple things on it. One, it will have our force graph. So these will be the forces that we're going to set in the control panel down here below. Now, don't worry about any of this. I'll go over how to set all this up a little bit later. 
The next thing that you want to take notice of on the graph is the red crosshairs that you see moving up and down the force line that I had set. Now the reason why this is important is because the red crosshairs are going to show the actual amount of force that is being applied to the yoke. So once we get into certain effects like turbulence and dynamic forces, you will notice that the red crosshairs are going to go above or below your actual force line that we have set. And that's because using dynamic forces, as the plane speeds up in the air, you're going to have more resistance across your stabilizing surfaces. So the first thing that I would like to test before we move into any of the effects is the max pitch force on the yoke. Now also keep in mind that when you're setting up your pitch and roll forces, your roll force will usually be about half of what the pitch force is. But to demonstrate the forces of the yoke, I thought the best way to do that, to relay that in a video, would be to use a luggage scale. Now for this, I'm also going to be using an additional camera so that you can get a close-up view of the force that's required on the luggage scale. So the first thing I'm going to do is to go into the force section and we're going to dial this all the way up to 60. Hit send. And there we go. All right, so now I got the luggage scale hooked up. We're going to pull on this until we get almost to its maximum deflection point. Because, of course, if you hit the deflection point, you could pull harder than the forces that are available in the yoke. So let's do that. Okay, here we go. Okay, so as you can see, the max force that we have on the yoke is 13 and a half pounds, which is exactly what it is rated for in the spec guide. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to test is the maximum pitch force on the yoke. So I've already set to the maximum pitch force of minus and plus 30. I'm going to hook up the luggage scale and we'll see the reading that we get there. Now, just keep in mind that this reading may not be as accurate just from the location of where I have to attach the uh, luggage scale too. So I'm trying to get it to its farthest outer point. As you know, the farther out you go acts as a lever. It takes less force the farther out you go. So let's just see what we get. All right, here we go. Okay, so as you can see there, we were right around six and a half pounds, give or take. Again, this is not the most accurate way to do this, but I thought this is probably the best way for me to relay the information to you at home while you're watching it through the TV. So now that we have gone over the max forces of the yoke, now let's take a look at some of the effects that are in the effects tab. The first effect that I want to take a look at is the yoke physics. What this will do, it will allow the yoke to go full forward as there's no air pressure being exerted on the ailerons, so they should just flop down and the yoke in turn will go forward. So let's see how that is. We're going to press enable and we are going to enable all the effects. All right, so I hope you just saw that, but the yoke went full forward. The other thing to take note of is Everything on this yoke is adjustable. So if you don't like any of the settings or the feel, you can adjust it the way you want it to feel. So for this demonstration, let me show you how much force is exerted on the yoke using a 15% full forward force in the yoke physics. So right there is just about uh, centered on the yoke and we've got about six pounds of force to pull that yoke forward now if that's the correct amount of force for this aircraft honestly i don't really know but again you can change that by just increasing or decreasing the amount of yoke force here the other effect that i want to take a look at is the dynamic effects now because we're still on the ground the engine's not running the stabilizing surfaces don't have any air pressure going across them so the amount of force that's going to be on the yoke should be very minimal, at least in the roll axis. 
So as you see here, it is very easy to turn the yoke now that we've enabled dynamic force. Now, for those of you who fly real aircraft, you might be saying, wait a minute, that yoke shouldn't be coming back to center that easily. Well, let me show you, there is a way that we can adjust all of this. Remember, I said everything's adjustable. So we can come in and adjust a dampening value to the yoke. If I go and change my dampening variable to 70, hit change. And now if we take a look at the yoke again, I can actually, if I move the yoke, I can just hold it in that position and let it go. And it'll stay there. The next effect I want to take a look at is engine vibration. So let's get the Comanche started up and we'll show you what that's going to look like. All right, so now that we have the Comanche started, hopefully you're able to see the yoke vibrating uh, from the second camera angle here. And this vibration will change depending on the RPM of the aircraft. So once you're in cruise, you will still feel the vibration of the engine. Now I do have one quick tip for the Comanche as of right now. Until Fabian gets the trim situation worked out with A2A, what I would suggest to do is if you're using an auxiliary hardware trim device like a Bravo or anything else, then I would turn the software trim speed down to zero. By turning the software trim down to zero, we'll eliminate the yoke from moving in and out as you're trimming the aircraft. Also, I've noticed if you're using the autopilot in the Comanche and the yoke is moving in and out while you're adjusting the trim, it will then take that as you applying force to the yoke and then it cancels the autopilot. Another thing I wanted to show you before we take off, if we head back to the general tab and we go to our roll axis, you can see how the red crosshairs are bouncing up and down. That is to replicate the engine vibration and rumble, and that will show you the amount of force that's being applied to the stick. All right, so now what I want to do is demonstrate the dynamic force effect, and right now we're going about 100 miles per hour. So with using dynamic force, I can expect that the amount of force required to move the yoke is going to be a lot less than if we were at full speed of the aircraft. We're actually going to be using the chart feature on the general tab. Now we're checking out the roll axis first and remember what I said about the red crosshairs. This will show us the actual amount of force that's going to be applied to the yoke. Now if I turn this left or right you have to kind of read between the lines because of the engine vibration but while I'm turning the crosshairs are actually less force than what is set on my graph here. So as you see here, my crosshairs are bouncing below my force line that I have set. If I switch over to pitch, pitch is actually the same way. So the amount of force being applied to the yoke right now is less than what I have programmed here. And that's because dynamic force is in full effect right now. Before we speed up the aircraft, let's hook up the luggage scale one more time so we can see just how much force is being applied to the pitch axis. Now again, this is not the most scientific method, but I'm sure you should be able to see a difference from our current speed to the max speed of the aircraft. while we're still at a slow speed is I want to check out the stall characteristics of the yoke. So let's take a look at that. There we go. It, it's actually shaking everything on my sim cockpit right now. It's kind of cool. Now while we're stalling, if you take a look at the graph over here on the right hand side on the pitch axis, you will see that the amount of force that is being applied to the axis is hardly any at all and that's because we're only going 80 miles an hour. Now let's speed up to full speed for the aircraft and I will show you the dynamic forces in action. Okay, so we are just about up to cruise speed for the aircraft, going a little over 140 miles per hour. Now let's take a look at the pitch channel again on our graph 
and take a look and see the forces that are going to be applied to the yoke now. So now as you can see, as I'm pushing in and out on the yoke, the amount of force that's being applied here is greater than what I have set down in our max and minimum forces. And let's throw the luggage scale on there and see if there's a difference in the amount of force that we have on our reading here. All right, the next thing that I want to test out right now is you can see we have got a ton of turbulence. The aircraft is bouncing all over the place. So let's turn the turbulence on and I will show you what that's going to do to the yoke. Now it may be hard to see here, but the yoke is not only giving me feedback on the roll axis, but it's actually changing the pitch axis too. So that, that is fantastic. Now the turbulence feature is something that Fabian has been working on to correct some of the issues. And he has just uploaded a new version of the force feedback software yesterday. So I've been messing around with this all day yesterday just to get a feel for it so I can make the video for you. But man, I think he has got this thing dialed in because when you see the forces act on the aircraft, you will actually feel it and see it in the yoke itself. Now, another thing that I wanna show you while we're using the turbulence is if I go back to the general tab, if you look at the pitch axis now, you can actually see now we have forces being applied to our pitch axis due to the turbulence that we are experiencing on the aircraft. If we head over to the roll axis, well, of course, you've got the bouncing from the engine vibration. Now, for the turbulence effect, it's really hard for me to put a luggage scale on it, but I just wanted you to see just how turbulence is implemented in this and how it affects the yoke. Because this is such a new feature that is now working really, really well, uh, not many people have talked about this yet. And I will say, by turning on turbulence, definitely, definitely adds more immersion and realism into this yoke and into the sim. Because not only are you seeing the aircraft bounce around, but now you can actually feel it in the yoke itself. Okay, so I think that's gonna wrap us up in the Comanche. Now what I wanna do is go ahead and grab the Duke out of the hangar, and I'll get that airborne so I can show you the trim effects and the landing effects for the yoke. So I'll bring you guys right back. So now what I wanna do is show you how the yoke responds when you're trimming the aircraft. Now, when you trim the aircraft down, the yoke should move in, and when you trim the aircraft up, the yoke should pull backwards. Now, the reason why this happens is because the trim is essentially your yoke, but the trim just holds the yoke in a certain position to trim the aircraft. All right, so we are in a climb at 3,000 feet per minute. I'm going to trim the aircraft down and you should be able to see the yoke move inward. So let's see how that works. Okay, so now what I wanna do is try to demonstrate the trim forces on the aircraft. To do this, I've trimmed the aircraft down so that it's gonna require me to pull on the yoke. I'm going to try to get this in a video and show you just how much force is required to hold it level, and then when I trim the aircraft, how much force is required to hold it level at that point. Now I'm going to trim up on the aircraft to see if the force changes. Now there we go. I hope you were able to see the amount of force changing on the yoke as I was trimming the aircraft out. It's really hard to get that on camera. The next thing I want to do is test out the landing effects for the yoke. So let's come in for a landing. And for this, I'll also bring up the graph here so you can see the amount of force that's being exerted on the yoke right now.
Whoa. Okay, that just about shook my entire SIM cockpit. And speaking about shaking your SIM cockpit, when you pair this with a butt kicker, it really, really adds to the immersion. All right, so now let's move into some of the corrections I need to go over for the force feedback software, and then we'll get into creating profiles. The first effect that I need to correct was the software trim. The software trim operates a little bit differently than I thought it did when I made the second video. So what the software trim will allow us to do is to use an auxiliary hardware device to control your trim. But that's not all that the software trim speed does. It will control the amount of movement that the yoke has in relation to the amount of trim that is on the aircraft. So even if you were using SPAD, FSU IPC, Mobi Flight, or the default SIM bindings in Microsoft Flight Sim, you need to have your software trim speed higher than one. The default trim speed is five, and I feel that that is pretty accurate. Here's how I go about adjusting this feature. If you are using SPAD or FSU IPC, then you want to turn down the sensitivity or you want to turn down the ratio at which you turn your trim wheel to the amount of trim that's applied to the aircraft. Now the reason why you want to turn down this ratio is because the software trim is going to correct for your trimming of the aircraft with a yoke movement and the yoke trim. So now what I do is, once I'm in the aircraft and I'm cruising, I then start to adjust my trim. Now let's say I'm adjusting the aircraft trim up to ascend. If I start adjusting the nose of the aircraft up using my trim wheel, and I notice that the aircraft starts moving before the yoke actually starts moving, then I know I need to up my software trim speed just a little bit. And this way, the yoke will start moving quicker in response to you adjusting your trim. I hope that makes sense. So I found that anywhere between 4 and 6 on your software trim speed gets you a really good feeling of the yoke when you're adjusting trim in and out. The next effect that I want to go over is turbulence. Now, Fabian has done a lot of work with the turbulence effect, and he just released a new version 2.2.4 of the force feedback software and he's reworked the entire turbulence effect and let me tell you it is ph phenomenal now it adds so much more immersion and realism into the yoke and to the simulator I don't, I don't know I, I probably would never fly without the turbulence effect now there's a couple settings that I want to go over on the turbulence effect because when I explain them in part two I didn't explain them properly, so let me go over that. Let's start at the top. Your minimum force is the minimum amount of force that will be applied to the yoke. Default is zero. I chose to increase this to 5%, only because from zero to 5%, you may or may not actually feel that amount of force through the yoke just because of the dynamic forces that are being applied at higher speeds. So by increasing the minimum force will ensure that I'm going to feel all of even the slightest bit of turbulence because it's going to have a minimum force of 5% of what I have set for the yoke force. The max force is going to be the maximum amount of force that's going to be allowed to be applied to the yoke for the turbulence effect. For this one, the default max force setting is 50%. I found that using a 50% max force setting is going to really keep you busy <laughs> throughout your flight. Anywhere between 30 and 40% is going to be a sweet spot for the amount of maximum force applied to the yoke. The next setting that we have is impact percentage. This is going to be how much of the actual turbulence that is around you is going to be reacting to the aircraft. So if you turn impact down to 30%, you're only going to feel 30% of the turbulence 
that's going to be acting upon the aircraft. So this doesn't necessarily have to do with the amount of force that's being applied to the aircraft. This has everything to do with just how detailed you want the turbulence to be. For this, I like to keep it on either a 100 or 99%. I never like putting anything on 100, so I just put it on 99%. This way, while I'm flying, if I get any little bit of turbulence, I'm going to feel it. The level of force that you're going to feel from that turbulence is set by your minimum and maximum force. Now let's go over velocity. A velocity is going to be the speed at which the yoke is going to respond to the turbulence that's going to impact the aircraft. So the higher the velocity, the more rapid this yoke is going to be moving. It's not going to control the amount of force, but just how quickly the yoke is going to be responding and moving. For this setting, I've found anywhere between 4 and 6 is probably going to be the best setting. Five is default. The way I go about adjusting the velocity for the turbulence is as I'm cruising along, if I see the aircraft move because of the turbulence, I would expect that my yoke is going to move exactly at the same time that the aircraft does its little bump and dive. If it is delayed, then you need to bump up the velocity a little bit so that it's going to respond quicker. If you're finding that the yoke is moving before the actual plane starts moving, then you may need to dial down the velocity. In my opinion, just leaving this at 5 seems to work pretty well with just about any aircraft. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is go over my process of creating profiles for different aircraft. To do this, the first thing that I would recommend to do is to turn off any of your effects in the effects profile. So just disable all of them. The next thing that I do is I base every profile off of the default Cessna profile. The default Cessna profile that I'm using has a max pitch force of 25 newtons. The roll force will always be half of whatever your pitch force is. So we're really basing everything off of the pitch force and then the roll will just go along with it. Now the other caveat to my method in creating profiles, one, I'm not a pilot and I'm not training to be a pilot. So therefore being it as accurate as possible is not necessarily top of my list. So your needs may vary depending on what you need the yoke for. If you're training for your PPL or you need specific training in a certain aircraft, then you want to make sure that you have as close to the correct force profile as possible for the aircraft. Now, unfortunately, there's not much detailed information on the web as to what these forces are. Just like in the sim here using dynamic forces, your forces will change depending on all of the different variables that go into flying a plane. So because of that, you're going to either need to have first-hand experience of the aircraft that you want to fine-tune for, or you need to hook up with a pilot of that aircraft to kind of give you some baseline force parameters to input into the software. Now with that being said, if you're an enthusiast such as I, well in that case, your main goal is to have fun, to be able to feel your aircraft, and when you get into different aircraft of a bigger nature, that you're able to feel the difference in the yoke for the bigger aircraft. So what I will do is I will use the Cessna 172 as my base aircraft. I will use the max pitch force as 25 newtons. And then all of my other aircraft that I fly that might be bigger, I would then increase the amount of force that's going to be required such as the Comanche, I'm using 30 newtons of force for my max pitch force. And remember, your roll is always going to be half of your pitch force. So if I'm using 30 for my max pitch force, my roll force will be max 15. For the Beechcraft Duke, is a little bit bigger of an aircraft. So I've set my forces to a max of 35 newtons. And of course, the roll force will be half that. So it'll be 17 and a half. For the Cessna 208, is a little bit bigger. So I set my roll force to 40 newtons. And again, the roll force would be half of that, so I'll set that at 20 newtons. 
So that's how I go about setting the maximum forces for the various aircraft. Now, one thing that you do want to keep in mind when you are setting up these profiles is that you never want to use the maximum pitch force that you can apply to the yoke, especially if you're going to be using dynamic forces and turbulence. Just as I showed you as we were flying using dynamic force and the red crosshairs were actually applying more force than what I had set, if you were to set the maximum pitch force and the maximum roll force, once you enable dynamic force, you will not be able to go any higher than the maximum force that the yoke can provide. So you're not going to get the full effect of your dynamic forces and turbulence if you max out the forces in the force profile here. So a good rule of thumb that I use is I don't exceed 50 newtons of force in the pitch and I don't exceed 25 newtons of force in the roll. That way it gives me a little bit of overhead for dynamic force and for the turbulence effect so that I'll be able to feel all of those effects properly and not just half of it. So now you understand how to set your max forces. Now what I want to do is go over the point one and point two for the position and the force. Now again, this is all going to be personal preference. And if you're trying to tailor this to a certain aircraft, you can surely do that. One thing that I went over in part two when we were talking about the position of point one and point two this is going to be a dead zone, but not in the same sense that you are thinking of when you say dead zone. What this will do is it will kind of even out or flatten out the force curve from zero position to point one and point two. For me, I found that using minus three on point one and plus three on point two gave me the best feel. The other thing that I want to make sure of is when I'm turning the yoke left and right, that the yoke comes back to center. Of course, you have the ability to adjust the dampening effect of the yoke. One thing that will cause it to not come back to center is if you have point one and point two too far apart. So let's say if you make that minus 10 and plus 10, that's gonna flatten out the curve so much, it doesn't give enough resistance at the very center to center the yoke. Now, if you find in your aircraft, you're trying to tune your yoke, and you want the yoke to be heavier towards the center, then what you can do is increase your point one and point two force a little bit higher. Start where I've got it, work your way up. Once you get to the point to where you feel is acceptable for you, then you can stop. Now remember, I would also now set the exact same force in your pitch axis as well. Okay, so now you've got the weight set correctly, but there's just not enough play left and right. It's too tight. So now what you can do is increase point one and point two, if you wish, on the position. And that way you can flatten out the curve a little bit so it's not going to be so tight towards the center. But in my personal opinion, I think anywhere between minus three and minus five is probably going to put you right in that sweet spot. All right, so now that you have all of your forces set up correctly in the control panel, now let's take a look at the effects tab. We're gonna head over to the dynamic force effect and let's take a look at some of the settings here. For the minimum speed, I just leave this at default, which is 30. The maximum speed for the aircraft is all gonna depend on your aircraft. The maximum speed that can be set here is 200. I'm not sure if that's in miles per hour or knots. How I normally set the max speed is I will set this to the cruise speed of the aircraft or just below the cruise speed of the aircraft. And then if I exceed that speed, I will have the maximum forces being applied to the yoke anyway. The feedback ratio will allow us to adjust the force multiplier to our aircraft as we are picking up speed. So if you find that the forces on the yoke are just not enough, you want more force on the yoke, then you can turn up your feedback ratio for pitch and roll. Now keep in mind that you wanna make sure that you keep your feedback ratio the exact same for roll and pitch. And that's because we already adjusted all of our base forces. So now the dynamic feedback ratio will just be a multiplier of the base forces that we had already set. The last setting that we have here is dead zone. This is going to give a dead zone as far as 
the force curve from the center of the yoke. It is not going to prevent the yoke from sending data when you're turning the yoke from center. It's only going to reduce or increase the amount of force at the dead zone at the center of the yoke. For dead zone, I prefer to keep it at zero. If you add a dead zone, that's going to give a little bit of leniency or I don't want to say slop, but it just gives a little bit more give left or right so you're not feeling the full force on the yoke. And honestly, the faster you go, I feel the tighter the yoke is going to be towards center because all those forces are just forcing that yoke to stay at center position. You may have a different preference to that, but this is what I use. The last setting that I want to go over, I kind of brushed on this a little bit earlier, was the dampening value. Now, we have a dampening value of the pitch, and we also have one for the roll. Honestly, don't even use the one for pitch. It doesn't need any dampening whatsoever. But when it comes to the roll axis, you may want to increase or decrease the dampening effect depending on how responsive you want the yoke to be or how springy you want the yoke to spring back. If you want the yoke to be dampened a little bit so that it almost has like a shock absorber keeping it from springing back, then you want to increase the dampening value. If you want it to spring back faster to the center position, then you would turn down the dampening variable. Just keep in mind, you don't want to turn the dampening value down too low, or you could actually get a little bit of oversteer with the yoke. You'll understand what I'm talking about if you try it. <laughs> All right, the last thing I want to go over today as far as the profiles is a SPAD profile for the yoke. Now, the reason why I want to go over this is because your left, right, and center variables are different from what you're used to with your other hardware devices. We go into SPAD. I'm going to click on the CLS 60. Now, all the other buttons on the yoke can be programmed as normal. The only thing that you're going to have problems with are the axes values. The first axis we'll take a look at is the elevator axis. Full up on the yoke is going to be 12, so you want to pull all the way out and then hit set. All the way down, you want to push all the way in and then you can hit set. Once you have your minimum and maximum set, you now need to set the neutral position. Neutral position for this yoke is 8192, and that's what you will enter here. Once you have all that done, then you can hit OK and it will set the elevator axis for us. Next, we'll head down to the ailerons. Take notice at the very top for the axis configuration. Turn the yoke full right. We are at 16,372. When I turn the axis full left, we are at 12. So you would put those figures in for your full right and for your full left. The center is going to be 8192. Hit OK. OK again. Make sure to save your configuration, and that's how to set up the axis for your aileron and your elevators in SPAD. All right, so now let's go over my final conclusion about the FlightSim.com force feedback yoke, and let's talk about the value for the price. If you missed part one of the review, I opened the yoke up, and we took a look at all of the hardware that make up the inside. And I will say that by looking at all of the hardware, the motors, the board, how it's designed, I feel that the value that you get for the price that you pay is by far the best ratio of any force feedback yoke that's out there on the market. Now, I do want to touch on a couple things that I really like about the hardware inside of the force feedback yoke. The biggest thing that I noticed compared to other units that are out there. FlightSim.com uses a self-contained carriage unit on the inside of the yoke. Now, why is that beneficial? One of the reasons is because as that yoke shaft passes through the case of the yoke itself, there is no support that's needed on that yoke shaft. And that eliminates any binding that you could get on that yoke shaft. Now, some of the other competitors that are out there use the case of the yoke to support the shaft itself. And in my opinion, that is not a good idea 
because now if everything is not perfectly in line, now you run the risk of binding on that yoke. Now I wanna to touch on price one more time. I did go over this in part one. As of right now, if you purchase the Force Feedback CLS 60 yoke from FlightSim.com, the price is $8.99. Once they move into distribution networks, they will need to increase the price to help compensate for the fees that all the distributors are gonna charge. If you wish to purchase any of the FlightSim.com products, I will post links down below in the description for their website. Please know I am not affiliated with any of the products. Now, the other thing I wanted to touch on is who should buy the CLS 60 versus the CLS 120? Well, again, your needs may be completely different than mine. And because I'm not a pilot, I don't require the actual forces in that specific aircraft for me to enjoy my flight simming time. Now, if you're someone who is going out for your PPL or you're training for a specific aircraft, the yoke that you choose is going to really depend on the aircraft you're training for. However, if you're someone like me that is a flight sim enthusiast and possibly one day I might go for my PPL, the CLS 60 is probably all you're ever going to need. Now, I'm not trying to discourage anyone from upgrading their unit to a 120. And by the way, Fabian will have upgrade kits for the CLS 60 so that you can upgrade to the 120. On the other hand, if you're someone who likes flying Airbus aircraft, then you probably want to hold off to when FlightSim.com comes out with their force feedback stick. All right, folks, that's going to wrap us up for today. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on the channel. And a big thanks to Fabian and the team over at FlightSim.com for sending me the CLS 60 for review. If you have any comments or questions, please post them down below in the comments section and I'll get right back with you. If you enjoyed today's content and found it useful, make sure to hit that subscribe, tickle on that little bell, and smash that thumbs up button to all my flight simmer friends around the world. Keep the blue side up and we will see you on the next one. Thanks for watching everybody.